we purchased the house in uh, June and then did various moving and various kinds of things and so on. And then we removed on the 12th of September. And that's the day our oldest daughter was born. <laughs> and so we took Barbara to the hospital at about 3 o'clock in the morning, went back to deal with the mover for the final things, back to the house in Holworth, back to the hospital, and that was exactly when Janice was born, I know, as I saw her fairly soon. <laughs> yeah, how did, how did you swing that? Well, that's just the way, that's the way it worked out, <laughs> you know, just the way it worked out. I recall in one particular day looking at a house that it, uh, didn't have a second floor. It was right out smack on the road. It, uh, so it had, could have no more than, say, four rooms downstairs. The next house I looked at looked at was this rather tall thing with three, gara three garages. And as we drove past, having the experience of these two odd houses, I said, I, I stopped the car and I said, let's talk to the A's and them. Tell them, this is the kind of house we're looking for. You get the size of the house, placement, this is the house. So I went back to him and I said, you know, let me give you an address. That'll tell you what we're looking for. It was 474 Hallworth Avenue. And he said, 474? He said, that house is for sale. <laughs> I said afterward, I lost my bargaining power <laughs> immediately. <laughs> At the time it happened, strangely enough, we didn't have any idea how bad the damage was. And I was cooking dinner in the, in the kitchen, obviously, and the dog and I were cooking dinner, of course. And um, Bob was upstairs, and he was on the stairway when the tree came down, and it came down practically on the spot he was sitting in at the time, because there was a desk there. And even the dog didn't bark. I mean, and I thought, oh, there's a branch come down. In, in retrospect, I, I'm standing over the main supports of the house because I hear this kind of ripping sound, but I don't feel anything. And, uh, well, something fell over the roof. And, and so I went up to, and we have a thing, a ladder you pull down. And I go up to, to see, and I go to reach to, to, to turn the light on up there. It's not there. Indeed, there's nothing up there. <laughs> and I see this huge tree that just went across the bedroom. <laughs> huge tree within less than 10 minutes. Six, seven minutes. The town was there, the police and the, the uh, ambulance were there. So they hustled us out of there. And I said, well, wait a minute, I have to get my pocketbook and my jacket. And, you know, I just really had no idea that there was this really huge emergency situation. And um, I did remember to turn the stove off, too. <laughs> and I said, you have to leave the house, yeah. which was true, absolutely, because further damage wasn't being done. And I do remember taking the dog, and he said, the dog doesn't come. I said, the dog is coming. <laughs> Could you go back in to get anything, or you just had oh, to? Oh, uh, uh, not that night, no. Uh, we, we, I mean, we were, and I, were, I mean, was, you got to get out of the house. Now, the next day, I couldn't get into the bedroom. I, I, I got my computer out, uh, and I put a ladder up to the front window and opened the front window and crawled in the window, and the computer ran, <laughs> it was running, and, and the tree wasn't far away from it. <laughs> uh, I got other stuff out, records and so on. I, well, I lost all my clothes. <laughs> Had to get a new wardrobe. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> I 
the, the people who lived in the area that I was teaching became to dislike uh, people from the north because there were so many going down there for, to, to help with the civil rights uh, situation and trying to get to franchise black people and so forth. The, the people, I, I chose to teach, well, I had a choice of two schools, one in the middle of Anison, which was a small city, and one in, on the country, in the countryside where we had pot stoves on the, in the classrooms and the teacher had to shovel coal in the pot stoves and the kids came to school barefoot most of the year. Uh, so that was a really different uh, situation entirely. They were lovely people and the little kids were so sweet and uh, and friendly and um, you know we had no incidents that were unfortunate at all. It was an oiled dirt road. <laughs> For yes. oh, how many years? Almost uh, 20 years? An oil dirt yeah, road, yep. 15 years, close to that. Uh, and they would spread oil out to keep the... Uh, dust to get the, the, down. The, the, down, to keep the dust down, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then when the roads were paved and repaved in town, when the uh, sewer went in, well, the road was paved. Why did you want to write? Well, because I love to read. I can remember reading my mother's book of Little Women, and it had been in her family since she was small herself, and it had been read so many times that the, you would open up the cover and there would be just a stack of separate pages and you would have to read the pages and put it back down very carefully. I was in the Bergen County Historical Society for many years uh, and all sorts of volunteer situations, obviously. Um, but I am a fervent history um, student. Well, you were the program director there for how many years? And, and uh, 15 years, yeah. yeah. Fifty years ago this month, an uprising inflamed this city and spread around the world. Columbia University students, stirred by the fires of 1968, took over their campus and closed the school. On April 23rd, anti-war fever mixed with outrage over Columbia's plan to build a gym in Morningside Park sparked students to take over the administration building Hamilton Hall. For seven days, Columbia was paralyzed as the world watched. In April 1968, uh, students gathered at the Sundial in the middle of campus uh, to protest a number of things that they were uh, concerned about. Uh, there, was the, there were students who were concerned about the university's complicity in the Vietnam War effort. They were critical of the university's relationship with the Institute for Defense Analysis. They were upset about the university's uh, allowing of CIA recruitment on campus. Then you have students who are upset about Columbia University's relationship to the surrounding Harlem community, and in particular its decision to build a, par a gym in Morningside Park. But I don't think a gym nine stories high with facilities for black people in the basement with a back door it's something that black people want. As of a certain morning, five buildings were occupied. 
But the main building was occupied. Uh, I was in the central administration at that point. I was on the first floor, and the president was on the second floor, and so on. The second floor was totally taken over. But the university was shut down for a week, and, and that had difficulty in the spring of holding classes. The university doesn't survive if you can't overcome that. <laughs> Every spring after 68, for, for at least three springs, you had some temporary shutdowns. And so you, you were going through this very difficult time of stabilizing university and, and uh, Shutdowns surviving. by student activities? Oh, yes, and, and outsiders coming in to join that. So we're jostling around on, on the steps, of, not on the steps, but on the, the, the campus there. And uh, I'm not going to, you know, they're saying that I'm not going to get anywhere. Uh, and we're just trying to decide where they're going to take me and all this kind of stuff. And what, what did you do during that time you were being? I'm talking to some of them. I was talking to other people I did know, you know, but here is a group around. You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. I, I wasn't roughed up. You're just not going anywhere. <laughs> okay, it's midnight. <laughs> So it was fairly affable as those things. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it, it wasn't vicious. Were you scared at all? You know, I can't say I was because I'd been through all this crazy stuff going on. And there was a guy who was a chemistry professor who was one of these guys who uh, had connections with the groups. And he, uh, he was a nice guy. I knew the guy. can't think of his name now, of course. Uh, and he came and diverted somehow or other at a certain moment. This was after around four or five hours, something like that. He diverted them on something or other, and he was doing it so that I could get away. I, I knew him. He knew me. You know, we knew each other. And, and that's how I got So, So I got home by, say, one o'clock, something like that. various towns and uh, Bob actually worked with a, another guy who lived at that time in Haworth and so we came and looked at Haworth and we thought, wow, we really like this. It was the house but it was the setting of the house and this is the place and I thought of that many times since, you know, how, how lucky we were and it's one of these things, it just worked out beautifully. <laughs> You're looking back on it, it all was beautiful.